Here's what's coming up on Network Africa. The UN's International Court of Justice hears South Africa's genocide case against Israel on the war in Gaza. The World Health Organization laments barriers to its work in Sudan, Ethiopia and Gaza. Plus... Morocco to lead the UN Human Rights Council amid criticism of the country's track record. Thank you for joining us. I am Lyo or Larry Day. The International Court of Justice, based in The Hague, is holding its first hearing in South Africa's genocide case against Israel, with several countries welcoming the move amid a global chorus for a ceasefire in Gaza. South Africa filed the lawsuit end of December, accusing Israel of genocide in its war on Gaza and seeking a halt to the brutal military assault that has killed more than 23,000 Palestinians, nearly 10,000 of them children. Well, the ICJ is expected to deliver only an opinion on the genocide allegation as the case is not a criminal trial. However, Israel has vehemently rejected the accusation as baseless, with the U.S., a staunch ally, calling it meritless. The 84-page filing by South Africa says Israel violated the 1948 Genocide Convention drawn up in the aftermath of the World War II and the Holocaust. Both Israel and South Africa are signatories to the United Nations Genocide Convention, which gives the ICJ, that's the highest UN legal body, jurisdiction to rule on disputes over the treaty. Well, South Africa is presenting its case today, Thursday, at the court, and Israel will present its defense on Friday. Meanwhile, Palestinians have gathered at the Nelson Mandela Square of Ramallah to thank the South African government for filing a case against Israel at the International Court of Justice. Participants held banners calling for a ceasefire in the Gaza Strip, with the mayor of Ramallah, located in the occupied West Bank, saying thank you to South Africa. Well, South Africa has been highly critical of Israel's military operation in Gaza. The governing African National Congress also has a long history of solidarity with the Palestinian cause. It sees parallels with its struggle against apartheid, the policy of racial segregation and discrimination enforced by the white minority government in South Africa against the country's black majority until the first democratic elections were, were held in 1994. Well, Nelson Mandela had also compared the plight of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank with that of black South Africans under the apartheid system. <coughs> Well, let's discuss South Africa's case against Israel at the ICJ. Joining us now is Charles Adeogun Phillips, a former prosecutor at the International Criminal Court. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your time. Thank you for having me. Well, as Happy a former... Year. Happy New Year to you. As a former prosecutor at the ICC, let's begin with uh, your assessment of this case from South Africa against Israel. Well, the South Africa seeks to base the ICJ's jurisdiction on Article 9 of the Genocide Convention, as, as you've rightly pointed out, both South Africa and Israel are parties um, to the Genocide Convention, so they're contracting parties. The, the case itself raises important issues concerning the Genocide Convention itself. Um, the first issue is that the, the provisions of the Genocide Convention imposes a fundamental obligation 
and contracting parties to the convention in that state parties to the convention have an interest of their own in the proper interpretation and application and the fulfillment of those obligations in that convention, regardless, regardless of whether or not they are directly affected by those alleged violations. In addition, um, the prohibition against such a, a egregious con conduct, uh, such as genocide, is a preemptory norm in international law. And what that basically means is that a, a state party like South Africa can bring a case before the court on behalf of the international community as a whole. And that is what is known as common interest rights as enshrined in the Genocide Convention uh, itself. So it, it, pre it presents quite a few uh, unique issues uh, in relation to the ability of states um, to have jurisdiction before the International Court of Justice in, in, in relation to this case. Now, the prohibition contained in the Genocide Convention is an absolute one. It's not an obligation. And therefore, it is not enough, for example, for I Israel to argue that it acted in self-defense or in response to provocation. Israel's response, therefore, has to be within the ambit of international law, and there are absolutely no exceptions. And no, no, no genocide cannot, under any circumstances, be justified. Indeed. While we wait to, you know, hear from Israel tomorrow, it will be bringing its defense at the court. But what, what can one expect uh, from the general proceedings? Is the court able to, you know, make Israel stop the war in Gaza? Well, the, 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 the measures that are being conducted at the moment are referred to as provisional measures, um, a bit like um, a hearing for injunction or injunctive relief, um, which is what we would refer to it as in Nigeria. Um, it's designed to adopt the status quo to preserve the evidence pending the hearing on the merits, which may be about two years away from now. So uh, in legal terms, provisional measures are sought to protect what we refer to as core rights under the convention. They are not a request for the determination on the merits of the case. Um, what do I expect Israel to be saying? Well, I expect Israel to be saying that whatever is going on in, 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 is in uh, Gaza at the moment um, is not a violation of the, gen of the Genocide Convention. It may amount to other crimes, international crimes, but it's certainly not um, a violation of the Genocide Convention in that there is a specific interest, uh, uh, there's a specific um, mens rea to be demonstrated uh, for the crime of genocide um, to be proven. And th that is referred to as a specific interest to commit genocide, which is in Latin called the dolus specialis. You have to demonstrate an intention to destroy a group in whole or in part. And Israel, of course, will be challenging that no such uh, intention exists. Uh, I, that's what I suspect they'll be, they'll be saying. All right, then. Uh, earlier on, you know, you mentioned the international community, South Africa bringing its case on behalf of the international community. And we've seen several countries welcoming South Africa's ICJ case against Israel, but not Israel and, you know, its staunch ally, the U.S. In fact, the U.S. Uh, tags this case as meritless. Do you agree with this? No, I, I certainly don't. I mean, I, I certainly don't. I, I, I'm not going to make... Um, any any uh, comments in relation to the merits of the case, um, all the court has to consider at this case is that there's a prima facie case uh, of irreparable harm if um, the orders are not given. And I think it's sufficient enough at this stage for South Africa to demonstrate that there's a prima facie case um, that there would be irreparable prejudice suffered if these provisional orders are not granted by the court. I think at this stage, um, that, that's what the court needs to, to concern itself with. All right, then uh, we'll wait and see how it all pans out. Tomorrow, Israel will be giving its defense. But in the meantime, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Charles Adelgun Phillips, uh, former ICC prosecutor. Thank you for your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Or well, still on the war in Gaza, the leaders of Egypt, Jordan and the Palestinian Authority, which administers parts of the Israeli-occupied West Bank, have met in the southern Red Sea city of Aqaba 
to discuss the war and the surging violence in the West Bank. Jordan's King Abdullah II, Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi and the Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas have continually called for an immediate ceasefire and have met several times during this conflict. The summit comes as the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is also in the region. Egypt and Jordan have acted as peace brokers in past conflicts between Israel and Hamas that rules uh, the Gaza Strip. Both nations have accused Israel of trying to liquidate Palestinian demand for statehood by driving uh, the citizens off Gaza. The World Health Organization's Director General Tedros Ghebreyesus is lamenting that although the health body is equipped with supplies, teams and strategies, lack of access to the Gaza Strip has stomped its plans to deliver aid to the area. According to the body, intense bombardment, restrictions of movement, fuel shortages and interrupted communications have made it difficult for humanitarian aid. He is also concerned that lack of portable water and overcrowding are creating ideal conditions for diseases to thrive. He pointed this out. Uh, that this is the situation in Sudan and also in Ethiopia. Uh, both countries, he says, have already descended into uh, thousands suffering from cholera and other conditions as conflicts, drought and displacement drive widespread hunger and disease outbreaks. Almost 90% of the population of Gaza, 1.9 million people, have been displaced and many have been forced to move multiple times. People are standing in line for hours for a small amount of water, which may not be clean, or bread, which alone is not sufficiently nutritious. Now to Sudan, where the situation is continuing to deteriorate after nine months of conflict. Increasing violence, mass displacement, Spread of diseases such as cholera, insecurity, and looting are undermining the work of WHO and our partners to save lives. We are also deeply concerned by reports of increased sexual and gender-based violence, as well as reports of family separation and child recruitment. Conflict, drought, and displacement are driving widespread hunger and disease outbreaks including media reports of near famine conditions in Tigray and Amhara. The Somali armed Islamist group Al-Shabaab has seized the United Nations helicopter along with nine people, both passengers and crew. UN mission in Somalia, or UN SOM, confirmed an aviation incident uh, involving a UN-contracted helicopter conducting a medical evacuation which landed in the territory held by Al-Shabaab in central Somalia. According to the UN, the helicopter landed close to the Gadun village in the Gal Gadud region due to a technical glitch. Well, some media reports say the insurgent group killed one person. United Nations spokesperson uh, for the Secretary General Stefan Dujaric says the safety of the victims, uh, because of the safety of the victims, much information cannot be divulged. I can confirm that there was an incident involving a uh, UN contracted helicopter that took place today in uh, Galmudug in Somalia. Uh, response efforts are underway, uh, but I, I think if you will understand, for the sake of the safety of all those on board, we're not going to say anything more at this point. Welcome back to the program. Morocco has won a vote to lead the United Nations Human Rights Council despite protests from South Africa that Rabat's human rights record mean it is unfit to lead the council. In a vote in Geneva on Wednesday, Morocco's ambassador Omar Znibe was elected council president after he received 30 votes, while his South African opponent, uh, Ambassador Msoli Nkosi, secured 17. 
It is, South, it is Africa's turn to take the presidency of the UN Human Rights Council, but because African nations uh, could not agree on a candidate from among the 13 members, a secret ballot had to be conducted. Following his success, Mr. Znive says the council's work is very important and very fundamental to the promotion of and respect towards human rights as universally recognized. Morocco is seen by several African nations as an occupying power in Western Sahara. So Robert's candidacy was also opposed by its neighbor, Algeria. The UN Human Rights Council was established in 2006 with a mandate to protect and promote human rights around the world. A vessel carrying a humanitarian shipment of 23,000 tons of fertilizers for Zimbabwe from the Russian company Ultrachem has arrived at the port of Beira in Mozambique. The Russian ship carrying the shipment of fertilizers moored at the port of Beira. According to the company, the shipment to Zimbabwe is the fourth delivery of fertilizers from the group to Africa free of charge. The company has already sent more than 100,000 tons of fertilizers to the continent, and this is in line with uh, Russia's President Vladimir Putin's promise uh, that Moscow will deliver about 25,000 to 50,000 tons of grain to six African countries free of charge. And this was made during the BRICS Business Forum on the sidelines of the 15th summit in Johannesburg. Well, in November last year, a sheep carrying 25,000 tons of grain from Russia arrived in Somalia's Mogadishu, being the first shipment of food that the Russian government had promised for the continent. Paul Zakaria is the executive director at Zimbabwe Farmers Union, and he explains the importance of the fertilizers to his country. Even with our own wheat, we do make bread, but it is the quality that, uh, that, uh, that we are after. So, of course, the wheat that comes from outside can be used to improve the quality of the bread and other confectionery products that we, we prepare out of the wheat that we have, plus the wheat that we receive from outside. So, the, coupled with that, it is also the issues to do with uh, the climate uh, related challenges. Uh, this El Nino season might mean uh, we do not have as, as, as much uh, water readily available for irrigation, so that could lower our potential to produce as much as we did uh, the last two seasons. So, with that gesture, another 25,000 of the same grain coming into the country, it complements the resource that we have by way of strategic grain reserves, and then it pushes us even you know, into a better, a better future while we prepare ourselves for the next, for the next uh, wheat crop. As Zambia continues to battle a deadly cholera outbreak, President Hakainde Hichilema is urging people to relocate from towns to villages following the deaths of about 300 people. To decongest major towns, he says residents should relocate to rural areas where there is enough space and better sanitation. On Wednesday, the president visited the Hero Stadium uh, Cholera Treatment Center, where there are more than 1,000 patients in the capital, Lusaka. There, he says the government will take some hard-to-swallow measures in an effort to eradicate the waterborne disease. The health ministry says that more than 7,500 cholera cases have been reported nationwide since uh, last October. In the last 24 hours, it says there were more than 500 new cases and 17 deaths. Well, in a series of preventative measures, the reopening of schools has been delayed, even as the disease has so far spread to eight of Zambia's 10 provinces. The World Health Organization is expected to send about 1 million cholera vaccine doses in the coming days to help the country contain the outbreak. 
Global labor markets have shown surprising resilience despite deteriorating economic conditions. However, recovery from the pandemic remains uneven as new vulnerabilities and multiple crises are eroding prospects for greater social justice. This is according to a new international labor organization, ILO report, which says joblessness and the jobs gap have both fallen below pre-pandemic levels. The ILO's World Employment and Social Outlook Trends 2024 report also adds that the global unemployment will rise in the year 2024. We already know that um, in the post-COVID environment, the uh, people going back to work, um, that uh, in, the, in, in the women uh, uh, um, workers, they have gone more on the informal sector than the formal economy, which in itself has a direct impact on the quality of, of, of the job. But the report is again demonstrating that we have not been able to narrow the gap um, uh, on, on, on the basis of uh, gen uh, gender and as well as that the, the youth. So we need to continue in the various program, of course, that uh, it, the countries adapt to their own situation to incentivize um, um, or, or, or to lift the, the challenge that the women are facing in um, getting back to um, the labor market, as well as uh, opportunity created for, um, for the youngsters. The low pay and precarity in certain professions has been driving a lower amount of work that people are engaged in and leaving some vacancies open and contributing to uh, elevated uh, uh, unemployment rates particularly pronounced uh, in a, a, a number of sectors, for example, in, in transportation, truck drivers, cleaners, hotel and food services workers, warehouse workers, and the like. And so one of the, one of the important considerations for countries that wish to try to improve performance in their labor markets to reduce the jobs gap, uh, to bring more people who would like work but have not been able to find it, is to address low pay and poor working conditions. In 2011, Jani Toivola became the first man of African descent to become a parliamentarian in Finland. Now 46, the Kenyan Finn who has endured isolation and discrimination has retired from politics but still pursues acting and dancing. Mr. Toivola was speaking at a lecture with foreign journalists to educate them on his experiences and Finland's evolution issues it's sometimes even harder Finland's first black parliamentarian Johnny Toivola was born to a Kenyan father and Finnish mother in the city of Vasa in Finland it speaks of how the conversation about racist experiences is becoming easier to hold now than back when he was appointed an MP in 2011 even though there's not so many black people but there are black people brown people and for the first time we are coming together in one room and we're having discussions with each other. So I think this coming together also supports this, that there's more space to acknowledge one's experiences or to say out loud that I'm experiencing racism and that it is racism or what is racism. He believes his life in the public space was a boost to his gaining a position in parliament. I, I would say that may, maybe in my story there's a lot of privilege also in the sense that before I became an MP, um, I was an actor and a performer. Uh, and I also hosted some TV shows, so I, I was already quite a, like a public figure in Finland. Uh, but more acting and entertainment and nothing to do with politics. But then of course everything is politics. Being a black person in a Finnish TV is already kind of political. <laughs> uh, and just being yourself is a statement and creates all kinds of reactions from people. So I first started to kind of tell my own personal story, my background and my experiences. and. I was just invited more and more to talk on different stages. And all of a sudden I found myself in news broadcasts, talking with other politicians and decision makers and um, ministers. I was still the entertainment person, everybody else was from the political arena. But then I somehow discovered that I, I oh, I'm able to function here as well. In 2018, Mr. Toivola announced he would not be returning for a third term as an MP. The ex-parliamentarian, who was in the arts before his appointment, says even though more people are opening up to speaking about the experiences, there's still a lot to be done to eliminate the phenomenon of racism and inequality. 
And finally, on the program, Ghanaian chef Failatu Abdurazak appears to have broken the world record after cooking non-stop for more than 227 hours. Her team says it will send the evidence to Guinness World Records for official confirmation that she has broken the record. But the, the world record says it looks forward to reviewing the evidence. The current holder of the record is Irishman Alan Fisher, who cooked for 119 hours and 57 minutes. Well, last year, Nigeria's Hilda Bassi caused huge excitement when she broke the record before she was surpassed by Mr. Fisher. Ms. Abdurazak said that she wanted to ensure that anyone who tried to break her record after her would find it very difficult. And that's it on the program today. Thank you for watching. I'm Layo Olaride.